And we are live. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on, on where you're tuning in from. Uh, and welcome to this very special SMART live session, Tom's Helpline Dealing with the COVID-19 Crisis. Now, I was looking through the, uh, the information of, of the people registered uh, just yesterday, and I noticed that we have people from just about from over 50 countries and over 300 cities actually joining us live. So that's pretty cool. And to get started, something we like to do is while we're kind of getting introduced and getting settled, maybe if you guys could, uh, in the audience, just in the questions tab, let us know where you're tuning in from. Now, um, I know it says questions, but you can feel free to post your city uh, as well. Um, so, kind of getting into it, I am joined today with uh, uh, by three amazing communications experts. Uh, really happy to see two returning faces and one one newbie, one first time Smart Live session participant. So um, maybe guys, you could introduce you yourselves real quick, and maybe uh, Steve, if, if if you want to go first as the new guy. Sure. Thank you. First of all, thanks for having me, Alex. It's um, good morning. I'm in Chicago, day 19 of our lockdown here, and. Uh, this is the first time I've worn a collared shirt in 19 days, so I'm hoping you guys notice that I am wearing a collared shirt with buttons. First time I've had something on with buttons. Um, anyway, I'm the CEO of Crescenza Communications, and we are a communications consultancy and training firm based out of Chicago. And we've been in business for 22 years, and we have clients all over the world, and we help do communication audits and help them do training, a lot of writing training, uh, customized training, and that's it. Well, we're... we're uh we're happy to have you again. Thank you for joining us. And and look, if if you weren't, I'm not wearing a collared shirt, so so uh, it, it's all good, good. Happy that you you dressed up for us. Uh, all right. How about Jennifer? You want to go next? Sure. Yes. My name's um, Jennifer Sproul. I'm the chief executive of the Institute of Internal Communication over here in the UK. I, I washed my hair for you all today, so that's 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 the bonus. <laughs> Um, so just let you know, so the IOIC, we've been, we're a, a membership body solely dedicated to representing the internal comms profession, currently have around 1,700 members, largely within the UK, and working on content, training, qualifications, and, and helping really to lead good practice internal communication as well as advocate for its importance, which I think is going to grow even more over the years to come. Well, thanks for thanks for coming back uh, back for another session, Jennifer. Uh, you, thanks for having me. <laughs> you participated in our previous comms debate, which was a lot of fun. Um, so, so always to happy uh, happy to have you here. And uh, last but not least, one of our original original comms debate participants, Mike. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. My name is Mike Klein. I'm with Changing the Terms, which is my practice, um, focusing on consulting, writing, and um, kind of future shaping in the internal comm space. Um, I'm also doing quite a bit with SMARP um, to integrate internal comm strategy into the application of its tools. And um, I actually thought about wearing a colored shirt, but decided against it. <laughs> I wish I would have known that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, it, it, the, thought, the thought, thought is all that counts, you know? Okay. So uh, again, thank you, thank you, Mike, for joining, and, uh, and and happy to have you here as always. Real quick, I want to go through a few kind of housekeeping things, a few uh, guidelines for this session. So this session is going to be 100% Q and A focused. We already have a ton of questions that came in via email before the session. We're going to pick some of those out uh, and then look to answer questions from the audience. Um, and as you can already tell, you can leave questions on the right-hand uh, right side of your screen. Now, we probably will not have enough time to answer all the questions that come in during this session. I'm actually, this is interesting because my, my analytics here are telling me that we only have 27 people in the room, but based on how many <laughs> responses we got to the first question, or to the, to the uh, where people are located from, I think we just broke the 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 platform. So we have I, we have hundreds and hundreds of people joining in, and all of you have questions. Uh, if we don't have time to get to your question, what we will do is after the session, we will gather up all the questions, and Steve, Jennifer, and Mike have agreed to to uh, answer those, and we will follow up 
with kind of a roundup blog post uh, on blog.smart.com to cover the open items. Um, and during, you know, during this session, please, uh, if you're, uh, we will be live tweeting, but also tweet at us uh, with the hashtag comms helpline. If you post your questions on Twitter, our marketing manager will be bringing them in to the, um, to the live session and uh, we can pick them up from there. Also, something I wanted to mention is that I also, I already said that Jennifer and Mike participated in um, our previous great comms debate installments. We have a third one coming up uh, in late April, the 23rd of April to be exact. That's, that's up on smart.com. If you still have open questions, feel free to join us then and put them in there as well. All right. But I think we can go ahead and start get um, start going with the questions. So uh, I'll just switch over here. And the first question we wanted to bring up, um, obviously now people are people are putting in questions still, still on the right hand side. But we had some that came in via email that we wanted to cover first. So I think the first one uh, we want to bring in is from Niche from um, from GB. G, if I'm not totally mistaken. And the question reads, COVID-19 is affecting everyone. And so there's a wealth of information on the virus, keeping safe, instructions on what to do, etc. What gaps should we be filling as a comms team rather than repeating what employees hear on external channels? Now, this is super important because now basically everything in the media is about COVID-19. So where are the gaps that an, an in-house comms team uh, can supplement. And uh, maybe, I don't know, Steve, uh, do you want to go first and take a crack at this sure. question? Sure thing. You know, it's funny, I came downstairs early to um, try to figure out how to position my computer so I wouldn't look so fat. So I've been down there for two hours and uh, I checked out my email and I just came across this this morning since it's hot off the press. So they recent um, Edelman, I guess, did a special trust barometer study uh, and employers are seen as the most credible source of coronavirus information right now with 63% of the respondents saying they believe coronavirus information provided their, by their employers after seeing it once or twice, versus a government website, which is only 58%, a health company website, which is 56%, traditional media, 51%, and social media, 28%. So that's an opportunity for us as communicators to, to help shape those messages. But I don't think we wanna waste our bullets and sh waste our ammunition and our time and our effort chasing the external media, unless we have a secret pipeline into our government's task forces, you know, whatever whatever country you're in, uh, they're always going to be ahead of us. I, so we don't want to be the curators of information only. What I, what I think we can offer uh, as communicators is two things. First, you know, and here's what employees I think want: uh, company-specific facts, number one, and then reassurance and guidance from leadership. So one is kind of tactical, and one is kind of strategic. Um, the, the first one is, you know, providing facts about the company specific. Well, how is the company dealing with it? What's happening? And I think the important thing to note there is that this is not the time for typical corporate copy where you take two paragraphs to talk about how in an ongoing effort to provide our employees with a blah, 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 and recognizing that our employees are our family and our greatest asset and blah, blah, blah. I think we need to get to the point quick. I think we need to be concise and clear and transparent and timely. Those are the four main things, timely, concise, clear, and um, if we can get to that. And I always like to use the formula in my writing workshops, what, so what, and now what? You know, what do you want them to know? Get to that point right away. So what, why should they care? And now what, what do you want them to do? Hone their teleconferencing skills? I mean, whatever it is you want them to do, you know, what, so what, now what? And we put that in an email, or we put that on the intranet, we put that in, in the social, internal social media, wherever, you know, whatever the one source of truth is, and I think that's a very important job because it's hard to write like that in corporate America, corporate the corporate world, I should say. Uh, so if we can be the one to condense information, make it quick to scan, and get the important information across quickly, that's a big, big role for us. The second one, before I turn it over to my panelists, is uh, the whole reassurance and guidance thing. And that comes down to leadership. Uh, and that's, I think, our biggest opportunity. I, I, you don't want to talk about opportunities in a time of crisis like this. But um, it is a time of opportunity for communicators because we're needed and we can help. We can help organizations, we can help our employees because leaders right now, a lot of them are adrift. You know, I have a lot of, you know, executive clients and I'm talking to them, I'm talking to colleagues. They're adrift. I mean, these are very smart people and they're used to handling bad news. 
But they're used to handling corporate bad news, like layoffs and reorgs and product recalls and bad financials. They're not used to this kind of human bad news, where emotions are first and foremost, where people are scared to death, where people are afraid not of losing their jobs, but their lives and their jobs for that matter. Um, this is our time to shine. This is our time. We've always said, communicators, we've always said we want a seat at the table. Well, this is a unique time for us to use our unique skills as communicators to coach our leaders, to show them what to do, to show them how to do it, and really coach them up a little bit because they're they're out of their comfort zone right now, a lot of them. And it's our job to step in there and be counselors and not just order takers, but counselors and help them shape the messages they want to shape offer reinsurance, offer compassion, give confidence to employees that there is, they are on top of things and they are paying attention. So I think that's where communication fits into all this other information, you know, coming at people in the external world. We've got to really narrow our focus to company facts and then reassurance and, and, and compassion and, and from our leadership. That's that's awesome. Yeah, we, we uh, we've noticed something where the the, the kind of realm of communications or the spotlight the spotlight has shifted uh, to focus on internal communications and communications as a function to help businesses get through this. But again, the the question is like, did this did this shift? And now you know we have the seat at the table. But is this the situation um, where we wanted to, to to have it? And now. And now it's up to communications to step up and give that guidance um, and that reassurance. Um, reassurance. Uh, Jennifer, Mike, what do you guys think about what, what Steve just said? I mean, I there's nothing that Steve said that I disagree with. I think that that's very clear and, and cogent advice at these times. I think that, you know, it's funny, we've been talking to our members about it, it was, and like we're seeing, we've just done a survey and a lot of our members are seeing the biggest opportunity this is given is that they're having, is given us, they feel 76% feel it's had the biggest positive impact on their relationship with leaders. So picking up on what Steve says is absolutely that time. But I think also as well, I would absolutely agree at this point in time, simple and clarity, timeliness is absolutely it. The thing where we can help, um, that perhaps where governments are struggling or not making it right is that accessibility of language. You know, unfortunately, the government, it, things are moving so fast and the government are making schemes, announcements, minute after minute, time after time, that the media is keeping up with, but also employers are trying to keep up with. And often somebody, if you have to think about the, the position of your person you're commun communicating with, doesn't understand the language of what they're talking about. I guess where we can fill in those gaps is to go away and take that what they've given, understand it, interpret it, make it clear, give clear signposting and give clear action. The other thing I would say as well is that it's a time as well for us to show how what we are doing as society, as people, as employees, is actually helping to stop this pandemic. Because essentially, if we are going to win this invisible war, it's going to come down to communication driving us to make a sustained behaviour change. So if we want a sustained behaviour change, we need to make sure we're continually reinforcing that you doing what we're asking you to, you to do is going to enable us to win this war and get back to normality. And I think that we need to do all that, but we mustn't take our, I guess, foot off the pedal in reassuring and demonstrating how their changes and what we're doing is actually resulting in saving lives. So we feel empowered when we feel very out of control at the moment with something we can't see. I think that's something for us to consider. I'd, I'd consider a couple of additional things building on what Steve said particularly. Um, the, the notion of us having a seat at the table. Yes, we have a seat at the table, but it's important to recognize that as good of the work as, we, as our IC brothers and sisters are doing for organizations on COVID-19, um, it's very much very traditional, top-down, you know, even to a large extent, one way um, internal communications. And that's fine. It's also what we're known for, but it's not necessarily what's going to get us forward in the emerging world that's coming through. I mean, my biggest fear is that we're having a Rosie the Riveter moment where, you know, we're taking on a really crucial role, doing a great job. And then when we're done, when, when the role is done, there isn't an obvious transition for us to anything else. So there are people who are saying, it's too early to think about the future. I, 
utterly disagree with that. We need to be shaping the future now. And one of the biggest gaps in the communication from the media is any kind of meaningful talk about what things are going to be live like once the peak of this is over. Right. And, uh, it, and that's something also we probably will want to take a look at even closer, like dedicate a little bit of time towards the end to looking at how the world will look like post Corona. Uh, we were going through an unprecedented change. Our, our CMO Bruno made an interesting comment earlier, you know, shouting out companies and communicators that are going from companies with 3000 people in 30 locations to 3000 people in 3000 locations. So with most of the world working remote and that's not, that's not all. Um, but you know, this new reality, definitely, um, we need to do put in the work now to shape how communications turns out um, kind of post in the post corona world. I think there's some more interesting questions here. I wanna, I wanna pick something out and this, this one is relevant for you guys um, also interestingly because it's kind of coming from a consultant. So as a consultant, I feel like work has stopped when organizations need internal comms the most. At the same time, in-house practitioners are burning out. How can we help each other? So how can business like communications consultants and in-house practitioners help us out other than you know um, sessions like we're doing right now? I'm happy to have a, a go at that. We, I've been in some groups talking about this and, and it's interesting actually today in the UK, again, I guess there's challenges if you're a consultant about what that's done to your to your personal income. And and it's whether or not within houses who are, yes, and we're absolutely seeing that burnout, um, capacity is actually one of the biggest challenges for internal comms at the moment because they've always been at a very lean machine. And that's really challenging that agenda. The problem for consultants is they absolutely could come in and help, but I guess it comes down to those organizations and their spend, which you know we would hope that, that they would do that, but unfortunately that's not something we can necessarily make them do. I think that there are things that we can be doing to forge relationships during this period, um, whether that's reaching out to people, having those virtual coffees. One of the things that, that we're keen to do more of over here is to try and connect practitioners through virtual coffees, but also as well, whether or not somebody can just give some voluntary time. I know it's not gonna help pay those bills. I know that, and I know that that's probably what's most concerning at the moment. But actually, if you reach out and give that sense of free advice or free help or bit of consultancy to some of those people that need it, that are on burnout, those relationships will pay you dividends when things turn around. I think it's very interesting today in the UK, we've seen on Twitter, we've got the new Nightingale Hospital coming about and they are actually calling out for internal communicators to volunteer you know we they, they they can't afford to pay and again it doesn't pay that bill but if you have it in you and you can give some free advice i think now's the time to give it yeah i i, I was just gonna i agree with jennifer 100 percent. i think now is the time to give free advice now is the time where you're you're, you're right the caller is exactly right our, our consultancy is kind of ground to a halt and uh we're figuring out virtual learning, virtual communication audits. We're, you know, we're working on all that stuff, which we'll start putting into place at some point. No, no one's ready for that now, obviously. Uh, at the same time, though, we're reaching out to a lot of our clients and saying, "Hey, you know, we're not opportunists. We're not here to make a buck, but we are here for you. Uh, if you want, if you want some coaching, if you want consulting, if you're writing a an internal story and you want to take a look at it, um, if you're if you're doing a virtual town hall with your CEO and you need help with the script or you need help with the format, you know, we're here for you. We're not going to charge you." Uh, we're here for you, and we want to we're going to keep our relationship going. And that way, when things do turn around, um, you know, we still have our relationships that will keep drive us forward. Right, and and like also for everybody in the audience, these guys are we're going to be dropping in their their contact information at the end. So again, the, these guys are all super knowledgeable and super helpful in, in in times like this. So so feel free to reach out to them post uh, post session as well. Uh, Mike, did you have anything to add to this question that, that, that wasn't already said? Well, I, I think, you know, rather than giving individual free advice, if you're more disposed to it, this is a great time to be writing. This is a great time to be publishing. This is a great time to be networking. It's a great, you know, and, you know, even though there's not necessarily a lot of bandwidth for promotion in this climate, um, you know, being 
an advocate for what we do and also connecting people with each other you know because a lot of us are spending a lot of time reconnecting with old friends and old allies and and etc and you know making those connections and particularly if you know of people who are struggling connecting people with you know like minds or common geographies could make a huge difference i mean i you know i would not personally be giving a lot of free advice right now um directly to clients um you know unless you know they were doing really noble stuff that i believed in um but that's 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 me i think the key thing is be generous but be strategically generous well it's obvious that i'm a, a much nicer person than mike <laughs> I think we've already established yeah, that. Not, not, as, yes, not as greedy. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. I, this is, of course, an interesting topic because, you know, you, uh, you guys work a lot with in-house practitioners and our consultants yourself, so, so really interesting to get your insight. Um, I wanted to shift to a bit of a more, maybe like a tactical question and get your input on it. So, so if we're looking at the chat, we can see that how can we get our leaders to realize that email and intranets won't cut it for crisis comms, especially now that uh, that most employees or all employees are remote. What do you guys think about kind of the tactic side um, of, of communicating during a crisis like this? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, if I, if I'll jump in first. It's funny, um, we, we did an audit last year and my son is 20 years old and he is interning for us. And he came on site to a major medical center in the States and we were doing the vehicle analysis portion. And he looked at me and he goes, Dad, all they do is this website, this internet, and email. He goes, nobody my age is doing that. <laughs> nobody, nobody, age, nobody my age reads email. Nobody goes to websites. It's all right here on the phone. Um, I think that the main thing is, you're right, email can be cold. I think emails, again, none of the stuff is irrelevant. Email can be great for certain things. I mean, it's great for bullet points. It's great for people can hang on to it. They can print it out. They can, they can remember it. Um, intranets are, are, are great for interactivity, two-way communication, building communities, having conversations. If you use the tool properly, uh, all, through, all through tools are good. The problem is we misuse tools and we put really emotional information in an email and it comes across as horrible. We have one-way intranets that are just basically publishing one-way information, which is not what intranets are good at. They're good at conversation and, and communities. Um, to me, the most powerful tool right now, I think, with our leadership is video. And video can go to a phone, video can go to an iPad, video can go on the internet, video can do a link in an email. Um, you know, people want to see their leaders right now, more than ever. More than ever, they want to see their leaders. And I, when I say see them, I mean see them, hear them, hear their, their faces, see their faces. And again, this comes down to us. Uh, coaching, this is going to be way out of people's comfort zones. First of all, a lot of our leaders are not comfortable with the cadence. They need to communicate a lot more often than they're used to. Second, they might not be uh, comfortable with the medium of video. Third, they're not, going to be, they're not going to be comfortable admitting that they don't know everything, that there's not a hardcore plan to move forward because there can't be, because nobody knows where this is going. Nobody knows what's going to happen. People are doing uh, every day something might change. Leadership has, has this tendency, and you know, 25 years of doing this, I've met thousands of leaders. They have a tendency to not want to communicate unless they can get up there and sound like they know everything that's going on and they are the smartest person in the room. They have to be willing to get up there and say, this is new to everybody. And, you know, if you see people, you see some politicians doing it, and those are the popular ones, the ones that admit that this is kind of new. And that's where our coaching comes in. Coach them on the vehicle, coach them on, you know, how to, how to do the right video, keep it short. Um, all that good stuff is where we can step up and, 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 and really make a difference. Oh yeah, for sure. And we've we've seen a huge spike in uh, in in you know specifically in, in video usage on our platform as well. So it's really really cool to see that also people are adapting to that channel a little bit. But I agree that uh, that a lot of people don't yet know and aren't necessarily super comfortable with using it. And that's you know part of our role in in the communication space is to coach people um, on doing that. Yeah, I don't, I don't care if you're the CEO or or not. Nobody wants to watch an eight minute video of you. Uh, it's, it's, they got to be shorter and they got to get to the point and they got to be conversational and eliminate the corporate speak. And that's where we come in. That's what we do. Exactly. It's funny. We've been just doing some understanding as well from our side. And, you know, at the moment we're still going back to what Mike was saying as well is that it has reverted 
you know, a lot of our people are saying it's reverted us to a little bit of broadcast mechanism um, where we are predominantly relying on email at the moment. But after email, the what's being most effective above like social platforms has been the use of video. I think so. I, I would echo everything that, that, that Steve has said. And I think that also as well, if you can convince those leaders actually to step a little bit out of their comfort zone, not there's the language piece, but show yourselves a bit more authentically. You don't need to be wearing a shirt and tie and looking all corporate. It's a time to feel like human. So what if your kids run in the background and the dog starts yapping? You know, that's what your people are dealing with. So show that you're in the same boat, show that you're not above or alongside it. I think that that's really important to convince them that it's not just about, I mean, to get cameras there and make it all set up. Authenticity is what's going to carry us through. Remember what we're saying, we're all in it together. We, I mean, I've been talking to my team about the crisis and what it means for our business. And that's been very much video conversation, very much kind of going, look, I don't know guys, but I'm going to do my best to look after you, to protect you, to get through this. Um, but you know, I've never done it before. And I think that's as much authenticity as I can give. I think a lot of teams are also finding, it depends on your tech, it really does. There's different levels of tech that we've all got. But you know, I know a lot of people are turning to, to platforms for the sort of video conferencing and having just conversational sessions. So it's not, as Steve says, just like today, the news is XXX, actually just jump online, be available, sit there with your cup of tea, you know, invite the company to come in, say a couple of words and just see what, where the chat takes you. And don't be afraid of not knowing the answers. Isn't you know, And now is a time when people don't, can understand you not knowing the answers. Right, right. And can I add one thing to that, Alex? And that is, yeah, uh, that's brilliant. What, what, what Jennifer just said is absolutely brilliant. And I want to say that that was happening before this. I was seeing a trend with leaders who were getting away from the more stuffy corporate videos and doing videos, video blogs from their computer. They were doing it from the back of a limo. They were doing it uh, in an airport. Uh, they were doing these leadership blogs, vid blogs, whatever you want to call them. I was seeing a, a subtle shift towards less formal uh, leadership communications anyway. Uh, and what she just said is brilliant. This is, when now, this is when they want to know their leaders are human. I love that the back had a dart running in the background. That's fantastic. It's what I deal with that every day. Um, I think that that's exactly right, and you know this is just going to build on that. I think exactly. Well, I'd like, I'd like to add one thing about um, in defense of email, which is that even though video is much better at engaging people, people want answers to fairly detailed formal questions in, on a lot of subjects. And what we've seen in the political sphere is that literally you've had politicians extemporize on camera about the solutions, the changes, the, the policies that they're introducing. And then there's been huge gaps between what they've said on camera and what's actually been in the fine print. And so we shouldn't completely discount the value of email as the reference source, as the key reference source for people in this particular environment. I would right. agree. I think it's just, you know, that, that, you know, there's a need for that showing humanity. There's also a need for like email tools to use certain things and building FAQ sections on your internet about those real detailed things with the bullet point answers. I think mixed mode integrated comms it, it, it is what's needed. And I think it depends on your purpose, as you quite rightly say. Yeah, I, I agree with Mike, too. I, I, we, we have to use every arrow on our quiver. Uh, email, intranets, social media, internal social media, video, podcasts. You know, whatever we have, use, because uh, they all do certain things well. So play to each vehicle's strengths and try to minimize the weakness of it. Right. And, and uh, you know, interestingly enough, we, we did lose Mike on video as we were talking about video. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, he's still here, everybody. Don't, don't worry. And also, I I'm wanted to... very much here. <laughs> I also wanted to uh, shout out everybody in the um, in the question section, I see a lot of people also giving you know audience participants giving tips uh, on you know engagement and how, what kind of comms have been working for you. I love that. So so just keep that going. We're all here to to learn and and, and share best practices. Uh, I wanted to move to a question regarding uh, kind of again more like a situation of you know kind of internal internal communications hierarchy maybe if you. If you will, so there's a question that came in, which is, we're struggling to get heard. I'm assuming this is uh, from, a, from a communications team perspective. We're struggling to get heard. 
our board and HR are taking the lead on, on this during furloughs, the furloughs being actions. How do we as comms then make our presence known and support employees and like support during these furloughs? And, and Jennifer, I'm gonna put you a little on the spot now because I know uh, you, we were talking about this yesterday, how you know the IOIC has been doing a lot of work and around kind of advising companies on how to support these types of emotional kind of communications and a furlough would definitely be one. Uh, do you have any advice mm. on, on, on how a comms team can make their presence known in this situation? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and, and, and maybe, I'd, uh, uh, maybe I'll add to that, like not necessarily make your presence known, but like um, if the board and uh, HR are kind of taking lead on this, how can comms, you know, support and still make, uh, make that emotional connection with employees? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's it's always a shame when you hear that you know that that comms isn't being considered in such important times, which is all driven by how it's, it's impacted by comms. I think that in terms of getting heard and getting in there, I think that where we can come in, obviously, for those when you're dealing with with the fella, you can understand initially a company is going to want to work with their legal team to make sure they're doing everything, check boxing, ticking boxes, because we need to make sure we're also acting legally and we're doing everything that's right in the interests of those people and can understand that. Where we can come in and do that is as you're furloughing, but you, you're not furloughing, unless you're furloughing 100%, you're still going to have everybody else that you are going to probably need to work, uh, increase capacity, increase product. Activity, you're asking everyone else that's still working to absorb more potentially and you're also asking those people to feel safe and secure and motivated when they're worrying am I going to be furloughed next am I going to lose my job so whilst you know the leadership are thinking about dealing with the legality of that situation we have an opportunity to sort of come in and go guys that's all great can I understand we need to get the legal communications right and that might be better to be handled by HR who have studied the policy but actually, if you take your eye off the ball on those that are going to have left, these are the consequences that you're going to be dealing with. And this is the consequences to the business and what it's going to mean. I think, I and mean, you know, always when you're getting into those conversations, it's about putting it into a consequence that makes sense to them. So is that consequence that, well, if you, let's just say, reduce your call center people, I'm just coming up with a scenario, by 50%, but your call volumes are still the same, what is that going to mean for everybody else? So what that could happen is that this means this many customers aren't going to get dealt with because these many people aren't doing it. And then if these aren't doing it in this way, it's not going to work. It's probably, I'm trying to give an example of finding a business issue which you can show that if we don't think about this as an integrated communication rather than just, so if you're furloughing with the people, which is specific to them, but how you're telling everybody else that you're not following what it means for them and what the why the company is doing it why we're doing it another way how we're maybe going to be asking more of you um and, and getting them to stick with you i think that there is a real importance for comms to sort of battle their way in on that and if you can get evidence or any kind of top line stats to give you that kind of power and give you the courage i guess to do that the better i would uh, I, I agree with all of that um brilliant and uh you know god help the organizations that are relying on legal and hr to communicate during this crisis um mm -hmm. god help them because that's that's a dangerous path and i go back to when i was working for a company called westjet um up in canada and uh they uh, i was interviewing the ceo and i said so what do you want out of your communications team i'll never forget it he said steve i'm tired of them coming to me and saying what do you want me to do i want them to come to me and saying here's what needs to happen and here's why I can make it so. So I think communications has to step up at this point and say, instead of saying, okay, well, I'm here. What do you want? Do you want some advice about videos? Do you want, you know, what do you want me to do? We need to stop and say, hey, here's what we need to do for our employees. We need to reassure them. We need to provide timely information. We need to provide transparent information. We need to make sure that they're getting the information in the right channel. We need to make sure that our leadership is being trusted, that our leadership, we, here's everything that we need to make happen in this organization if legal can do it, great, but they can't. Um, HR can't do it on its own. So we need to go out and build a case, and I'm, but not, not just be an order taker. We need to go up there and say, here's what this organization needs to do if we're going to make it through this. And not only make it through it, but improve our engagement scores through this. Um, here's what we can do for you. And I think as long as we can make a case for that, they'll find a role for us. They'll find a place for us.
Mm. Yeah, that I, I agree agree totally with uh, with what you guys were just talking about. And obviously, this is a very emotional time, and a lot of organizations are going through this. So, so super helpful to to have you guys' input, Mike. I I think I might have heard you launching into something. Yeah, I, I, I have. I have just a quick comment about the 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 challenge of stepping up while at the same time dealing with order taker expectations. Real, the reality is a lot of managers, particularly those who have accountability for this, um, you know, may be interested in, um, you know, I see folks sharing their ideas and executing them. But at the same time, they may have their own views about what should be done. I think the key thing, you know, the, the real ninja thing is to be able to transcend satisfying the practical demands of whoever it is you're reporting to while at the same time um, delivering the outcome that needs to be delivered. <coughs> it's not, you know, just because we're an IC person, we can say, we can't say, okay, this is what you need to do now. You're going to let me do this. You know, we need, we have, this is a great opportunity for us to build that trust but sometimes we have to build that trust by doubling up on what we need to do along with what we're being asked to do. You know, I agree with Mike, and I just want to call out somebody in the chat room, Monique Zeitnik, I hope I'm saying that properly. Um, she was responding to something, she said, keep messages short, no time for rah-rah. That's what I alluded to earlier. People do not want the rah-rah, they don't want the corporate speak. Keep them short, keep them concise. And then she said, plus IC needs a seat at the table to have insight into messaging. We're the message massagers. I've never heard that term before, and I just want to say that's pretty cool. Uh, we are the ones that can craft messages. We are the ones that know how to craft the right kinds of messages, how to keep things short, how to get the relevant information up to the top so nobody has to, so it's not buried down below. That's all us. And uh, we're really the only ones in the organization that can do that effectively, I think. So again, as I said earlier in the, in the, in the call, now's our time to shine. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love that. Yep, keeping rah rah short. We there's a there's a question. I, I'm, I'm assuming the, the the response by Monique was related to um, uh, to the question about you know videos and the the rah rah videos. But yes, short, concise. Make sure everybody is is engaging with that uh, engaging with that communication that stuff. Um, kind of related to that. There's a question also from Danielle uh, from the Netherlands. So so uh, Mike's Mike's home country. As of now, um, what is your advice on how to keep colleagues and teams truly staying connected and engaged while working remotely? So again, we go back to the concept of going from 3,000 people in 30 locations to 3,000 people in 3,000 locations. It becomes a lot more difficult. Um, I don't know, Mike, since you're from the Netherlands, or you're calling in from the Netherlands, want to, want to take a crack at this one? I'll take a, I'll take a brief shot at it, because I don't consider myself an expert on how to do this right now. I think in about three, three months' time, we're going to have some really good ideas about what works and what doesn't work in the space. I mean, the, the, I think the most interesting trend that we need to watch is the evolution of people taking their analog and their face-to-face -face communications tactics and putting them on digital formats versus coming up with, you know, really remote working context appropriate um, approaches from the beginning and then having those become mainstream. In fact, that's kind of a building block for the kind of future stuff that I've been talking about that, um, you know, it's not just simply that where we work is different, the way we work is going to become increasingly different. Yeah, and I, I like what you said is that, and it goes back to something we were talking about just now earlier, is that nobody knows exactly uh, how we're supposed to do this right now. This is an unprecedented time time for everybody. But uh, but what but what you said is definitely super important. Uh, Steve, Jennifer, you guys got any input on how to make sure that people are, you know, really staying connected with the organization at this time? I'm going to pick up and just say one thing. I mean, obviously, this is where technology comes to the fore. It's all going to be about the technology as the enabler. Um, and we must see it as, as the enabler. It, it, it's not going to, you know, and we're going to have to probably 
play and discover. I would say my advice for anything that you're doing at the moment is if there is ever a point in your comms career to try and to have, you know, trial and error, it's now. You, we all can expect error. We all don't mind at the moment. We're all figuring it out together. So my advice when anything that you're trying, don't overthink it. You know, do you know, just try it and see if it works. I think in terms of the things, the practical things in terms of keeping people connected, obviously using the right technology, having video chats, you know, lots of people I'm speaking to are organizing sort of virtual um, coffee mornings, virtual sessions. Some people I know that are like at four o'clock every Friday, we're gonna all, we're gonna open up Zoom or some other platform and we're all gonna come on and we're all gonna come with a drink of our choice and just have a chat. I think what we need is to have time to enable the chit chat because that's the thing that we're gonna be missing. Because if you make everything too formal and too like work meeting-y, what makes us feel human and connected is having that time for chit chat and just shooting the breeze, not having everything too structured. I think I would try and make time to have those things put in regular places. People turn up, they do. If they don't, they don't. Don't over worry. I think the other thing as well is to coach line managers. They're going to be a real point that we need to work with um, because when something happens to you, your first response is to speak to you. To make sure our line managers are helping it. The CEOs are too disconnected from everybody else down there to actually really deal with it on such a large scale. I think you need to find it in pockets and help line managers and coach them about how to use technology, how to run virtual sessions, how to have time with their team. And the other thing I would say is, you know, we need light and shade. You know, everything feels very shady. Everything feels really dark. Everything feels that we need to help people if we want to feel connected and buoyant and, and positive is to have a little bit of fun and don't be afraid of that. And, you know, a bit of silliness, a bit of let's have an hour. We're going to do something stupid or we're going to do a virtual quiz or have a little leaderboard going on the side on the Internet and people answer silly questions and whatever. It's the simple things that gets us through times like this that, and the, the, the human things. Just trial it. If it doesn't work, scrap it. Try another thing. Just go for it. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. I love that. And, um, you know, I, I think what's happening here is this crisis is really accelerating things that were happening anyway. More people working from home, more people working remotely, more people relying on their phones to get information from the company, more people relying on technology than ever before. All those things were happening anyway, but now it's changing behaviors. Um, this is one of the first times ever during this crisis was the first time I ever turned my camera on my computer, ever. I invited a Zoom call with a client. I was just like Mike's face right now. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't put my face out there. Now I'm on it every day. I'm doing happy hours. I'm doing. Um, all, I mean, every day we do at least happy hour. I've had. I've had an, a whole complete dinner on Zoom. I mean, behaviors are changing. And, and Jennifer's right. Have some fun with it. Have people submit photos of their workspace where they're working from home. Have them talk about the biggest challenges, whether it's kids or dogs or cats running across the keyboard or whatever it is. You know, humanize this. We're all in the same boat. And uh, so Jennifer brought up a very important topic, which maybe we can cover uh, later. But, um, you know, frontline supervisors, I saw it in the chat a couple times as well. Those people are critical to this, and they're really under the gun. They're not getting the information they need. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're giving them, like, bullet points and stuff, but they, need, they want empathy. Employees want empathy. They want compassion. They want human, human contact. And, you know, we need to help our frontline supervisors do this sort of thing. To, to, to relate with their employees, to get on here and don't run it like a normal meeting. You know, have a drink or something like that. Have a coffee. Make it fun. Make it a little lighthearted. Be human about it. Um, again, after we can come in with coaching. I, uh, I, I love everything you guys just said. And one, one thing that definitely, you know, has become a reality for, for myself included, given this current situation, is that you miss a lot of the fun, like you miss out on a lot of the fun stuff when you're, working remotely like those you know just casually walking over to the to the um to the kitchen having a cup of coffee chatting face to face with somebody it becomes you know when you're social distancing like this you miss out um on a lot of stuff stuff like that so definitely uh love to hear you guys talking about that i think uh, i want to pick out one question still before we kind of what steve you were also alluding to kind of the future you know, future implications of this. And I know uh, Mike has been talking about this as well, but I did want to pick out one more question uh, that maybe we could cover real quick because it's slightly related to this kind of concept of frontline 
uh, managers and frontline employees in general. So this question reads, hi from Chicago. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the platform, there's so many of you that I literally cannot see people's names. Um, I just see hi from Chicago. Uh, my org is in healthcare. Uh, any best practices for communicating with our workers on the front line as well as admin employees? And obviously healthcare is super, super uh, important right now because those people cannot work remotely. Um, so what kind of tips and tricks would you have in this case? Well, you know, I'm from Chicago as well, so I'll take a crack at that. Um, we've had yeah. a lot of healthcare clients in the last two years. We work with Ohio State Medical Center, Nebraska Medicine, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so we do a lot in healthcare, and it's probably, I think, the most challenging industry out there because nurses are so busy, doctors are so busy, um, it's hard to reach them anyway. I think the, the, the one thing you can do is try to establish some routines, whether it's a team huddle on teams or whether it's a face-to-face -face huddle or whether it's do a routine with a regular cadence instead of just, you know, scattershot communications. Have a strategy, know what you want to communicate to them. And the other thing is talk to them. You know, all great communication starts with listening. Talk to your nurses. You know, we do we do full communication audits for healthcare all the time. And we sat with 12 nurses. We sat with 12 doctors. Talking to them is critical because we don't know what they want um, until we talk to them. Too often we communicate in a vacuum and say, okay, well, we're just going to deliver this information to them uh, via email because they can get that on their phone, even though they can't access their phone. Um, and we'll do a video, even though no nurse in the world is going to watch a video right now because they're way too busy. Um, now, I don't know, it'd be harder to do now during the crisis, but if you could even get three or four nurses and buy them lunch, if you could get some of the people on the front lines of healthcare or, or any healthcare, manufacturing, whatever it might be, uh, talk to them. Find out what their goals, what their information needs are. Find out how they like to get information. Nobody's going to have time to do a full-blown audit right now, obviously, and I don't blame them. Uh, we're all just putting out fires. But that doesn't mean we can't talk to people here and there. Set up a conference call like this one, th three or four people. Um, and talk to them about what they need, what the problem is. Basically put your ear to the ground, set up a, a virtual editorial advisory board. We've done this for many clients where once, you know, once every other week or once a week, we're gonna have a Zoom call with maybe 15 of us, and we're just gonna talk anecdotally about what's happening with you, what are you hearing, what are you hearing from coworkers, what are you hearing from colleagues? I think one of the things employee comps people have gotten away from is that whole reporting nature of it. We're very good at pushing information out, but the days of publishing information only are over. We need to be community organizers. We need to be um, conversation starters. We need to help people um, gather like that. And I think that's a huge thing to do with the frontline employees. I love it. I couldn't agree more, actually, with, with everything that, that, that Steve said. And, and, I, and I think that I would echo all of that. I think employee voices, you take one of the enablers of engagement and one of the listening and the thing that we can have such a role in is going to be really pivotal feedback loops conversation loops and i think at this time we have to throw some levels of methodology out the out the window but we just right. have to have you know a good indication to listen quickly and react and i think that on the front line particularly in healthcare what they're going to want is is pace of reaction they're going to want to be listen and then they're going to want to see you act really quickly because they're dealing with it hour by hour, minute by minute as it changes. So I think the other thing I'd add is that is listen, but make sure you are going to act. And if you're going to, even if you're going to act and you can't get them what they want, make sure you explain why. Um, explain why that's not happening. You know, it could be, you know, obviously over here in the UK, there's a big issues around PPE and how that's coming through. Um, you know, and we're looking at the government to do all of that. I'm, if you can show to them, we've asked, we're still here, this is what's going on. We're on it. We're on it. We're trying our best for you. And then again, just give them a little bit of moments of life and laughter. You know, let them record stupid videos or make silly videos or of them recording songs or putting out positive messages so that they can share around and, and it gives them that sense of light. They need a minute of light, I think. Um, that would be my, my extra comments. Leo, I don't have anything to add, but I would certainly underscore what Jennifer had to say, not just for healthcare workers but for anybody who's in high pressure situations right now that, you know, we volunteer, you know, we ask people for info, we volunteer to do something. Um, there is very little patience for non-response and non-delivery. We, we, you know, nobody has time to waste right now if they're still employed. Right, exactly. And I think this is, you know, something that, uh, that you guys have all been talking about and like Steve, you, you explicitly mentioned that this, you know, now's the time 
for us to be kind of community organizers. And now is the time to be that kind of, you know, the glue that keeps the organization together at a time like this. And that's, if you think about it, a lot of talk in internal communication specifically has been about how to get to that kind of strategic, being that strategic business partner. And now we have we have the kind of the role that uh, that we kind of keep everybody in sync and engaged and again glue the organization together. So uh, so that's something that's happening now. We're seeing that happen now more and more with that with the the clients we talk to. And this is something that will definitely continue into the future as well. Um, on that note, I wanted to go to to this uh, this question. I know that that uh, we also wanted to talk about how this will affect the future of, of internal communications. And here was, there was a question and also a nice comment that, you know, hi everybody, great insights from the panel today. Look forward to recommendations on the best way to communicate with employees once this crisis passes. How can they be eased back to work? And I know, uh, Mike, you've, you've done a lot of work and, and you know, you're discussing a lot on, on how, how the world of internal communications is going to look look post corona and um, you, you you know you go as boldly as to say that this is not optional that IC professionals need to act to shape the future so what are your uh, maybe you can you know start off with this how do you see the IC profession evolving uh, as we you know progress and then move past this crisis well I think the IC profession will evolve in a way that accommodates the changes in the workplace, ideally in a way that um, anticipates and adapts to the changes in the workplace, at least as quickly, if not more quickly than any of the other folks, which you know, you know, are out there to shape the organizational agenda. The key thing to remember here is that even after the lockdowns are over, I mean, nobody's really talked about an end game for the lockdowns. But the one kind of semi-fact about the near-term future is that it's going to be months, possibly a year, till we get a vaccine. What that means is that the fundamental dynamics of COVID-19 aren't going to change just because the, lock the lockdowns are over. That means we're going to have social distancing for six months, for six to 18 months. And social distancing um, in some form is going to really be the driver that establishes a new set of practices, behaviors, ultimately tools and, um, and practices. And it's going to change the workplace. You know, there may be some people coming back to offices somewhere, but it won't be at the same density. It won't necessarily be the same people and it won't necessarily be the same roles. Also, social and distributed work working, some people will A, like it and prove that they can succeed at it. And then it's going to be a hard choice to bring somebody back to a capacity constrained office when they're performing and happy and making better use of their time. So it's like the dynamics of remote working, the dynamics of office space, the dynamics of transportation are really going to fundamentally impact the workplace. But internal comms will change in some pretty unique ways. For example, um, social distancing air travel is two or three seats occupied per row. It's not, you know, 200 people packed in with middle seats going to a management conference somewhere. You know, the costs and logistics of things like management con conferences are going to become extremely painful for organizations that are going to be cash constrained coming out of this crisis. I would expect to see the art and science of management con conferences, um, not just morphing to digital, but becoming far less of a, an important skill set for internal communicators. And that's going to be very important on the in-house side. That's going to take, that's going to change the budgetary picture and it's going to change the skill picture and it's going to change the, um, the organizational priority picture. Um, you know, you got, you know, some other things is, you know, okay, how do you ease workers back in? What are you easing them back in into is going to be the big question. You know, there isn't going to be any normal to come back to. 
what they're going to, you know, we may find something that's livable, efficient, effective, but it's not going to be what we had nine months ago. Right. Yeah. It, that, I think that's an important, a po important point you just made is like, what is, what is the new normal? Will there be a new normal? And it'll look uh, substantially, substantially different. Jennifer and Steve, do you guys have anything? Yeah, to add? I, I, um, I, I do. I think I, well, I agree with Michael that there's some big changes coming. Um, I think, I think this whole thing's going to open up communications more. It's going to, it's going to open up like more transparency, more freedom. Uh, I think it's going to, I think it's going to dramatically improve leadership communications because they're going to be, they're going to be, you know, under, they're going to have learned under fire. They're going to learn that, you know, under the gun and they're going to realize the importance of transparency, of being human, of being conversational and not corporate. Uh, they're going to, all that, they're going to learn a lot of lessons during this process. And I think that's going to really open things up. And in the chat, in the chat room there, I got Michael Pankratz. I hope I said that right, Michael. He said, I wanted to share my company created a private Facebook group just for our employees. Admins managed to join requests against current employee rosters. We've had it for a while, but we got our president talking about it during the first crisis communication and engagement has gone way up. That's the sort of thing you're going to see more and more of. You know, you have these Facebook sites, we have Slack and we have uh, you know, different tools and stuff, but are people really using them? Uh, and I know a lot of companies that have Yammer that nobody uses it. I think you're going to see more and more of the executives are going to start seeing the power of these tools. Um, you know, they, you know they're kind of, they were kind of forced to it at gunpoint. But now they're going to start seeing the power of virtual communications, and they're going to start tapping into it and tapping into it and using it and doing things like Yam Jams, where they use Yammer to do a, a weekly Q&A with employees. We're going to start seeing more and more of that, I think. It's going to start opening up a little bit because of what they're going through now. I, I like the term yeah. Yam Jams. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to add, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, to understand what the new world and new normal is going to look like is going to take a while. I think we also have to expect as things ease, there'll be a rush towards human contact and then there'll be a sort of back to a sort of even keel again with different expectations. The other things I guess I would highlight is that, yes, the world of work is going to change significantly. It's already been changing, but this has absolutely fundamentally accelerated that from we've already seen globalization the trends of consumerism the tech economy taking over the changes of organizational design no longer being hierarchical now being more network based we've now seen the importance of climate change and what organizations are doing those have been bubbling along for a while what this has done is absolutely going to accelerate that picture um so then it's probably for our point of view is to understand how that new world means what's the new communication the things I think that will stay consistent from an internal comms professional point of view is our skills. You know, we updated our profession map a little while ago and we still, and um, we have been building for this for a long time. We still need to be strategic. We need to be able to understand people. We still need to understand, you know, how to write, create conversation, curate conversation, manage channels and communities, influence and advise and report. Those, our skill set will take us through this. But what I probably would go away is probably a leaving note is that spend this time when you can, when you're not in the doldrums of firefighting, when we get to that point where you can take a deep breath, take a time to really look at those skills that you've got and get as prepared as you can, whether that's from understanding the technologies and how to use them better, but actually from really understanding the business aspect. So when companies come out of this, how is this going to change their model and how they succeed? And therefore, how is it going to change the, the people that they have that are going to help them get there? If you can take some time to understand that, because the more prepared we are, the more on the front foot that we're going to be. But I still think our skills will 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 be the, that we've been developing for years are going to be the ones to get us through the next phase. Awesome, I, I love that, and I I like the the fact that you know we can leave on a bit of a you know a hint of optimism. Mm -hmm. um, this is an unprecedented time. It is a very weird situ situation to be in, but you know there is there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, look, guys, we could sit here and, and, and talk about these questions and answer these questions for, for hours. There's so, it just, it won't end. Um, so like I said, what we'll do for all the questions we haven't gotten to now, we will gather them and follow up in a, in a written blog post on, on blog.smart.com. With that, I would like to thank all of our amazing panelists for joining today. Um, you guys have been amazing. You, uh, really love to hear the dis uh, discussion and, and be a part of this. And I think our audience members um, uh, appreciated it too. I already, 
I already see comments like, love this webinar. Could we please have another session sometimes too, uh, sometime soon? Well, the Great Comms Debate 3 is coming in just a few weeks, and we'll be covering uh, similar topics there. So be sure to check that out. It is also on smart.com, but I put the link in the chat as well. Um, now, of course, we've spoken a lot about the tactics today, You know how you communicate with your employees uh, during, during a crisis, during a pandemic like this. Um, and if you want to continue communicating effectively uh, with your workforce across all channels, SMART can help with that. So, so feel free to reach out. Our information is there. Uh, all the information for all of our speakers is on the screen as well. Uh, guys, any last kind of parting words of wisdom? Uh, I, I just want to thank you, Alex, for, for organizing this. Um, it's fantastic that we got such a great turnout. I think as Mike said earlier, I think this is important to do this. It's important to be talking. I saw so many comments on there that it's just nice to be able to hear from people in the industry, you know, that we're not alone. We're not on an island. We're all going through this. Um, so I just want to thank you for organizing an Ida Blast and invite me back anytime. And uh, if anybody wants to, if anybody's doing anything really cool in this area, please shoot me an email. I'd love to see it. We teach seminars all over the world, as I said, and I'd love to feature you. And um, stay in touch. Like I said, we're not, we're all in this together. Stay in touch. Mm -hmm. I would echo that again. Yes, thank you, Alex, for organizing it. You know, as I always see, and as me as a human, if you, if you need somebody, if you need some help, my details are there. Reach out. If I don't know the answer, I'll do the very best I can to guide you or, or give you the advice or direct you in the right place. And I think my leaving note is, you know, we will. I know I'm being cliche, but we will get through it. And you know, things will be positive. Um, I don't know about you, but I look forward to running out my front door and just hugging probably my neighbor for the first time. That's that's what we've got to look forward to. And it will all be OK. And comms will be the leading light that gets this country through this one of the up, up outside of our frontline workers. You know, you, you could probably get away with running out and hugging your neighbor. I would get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> or, or beaten to death. And one, one of the two. Mike, any any parting words from you? I agree with both of my colleagues that, you know, these are great conversations and these are important conversations. My invitation is to continue the conversation, not just in the questions field, but, you know, start posting, start writing, start agitating. Um, the, the, we're going to get through this by getting each other through this. And just because we're stuck in our houses doesn't mean um, we can't just activate and mobilize our networks at this point. Um, you know, it's not, we're not supposed to be talking about opportunity, but for us, we have to, we don't really have much of a choice. So let's do it. And I look forward to hearing from as many of you who want to get in touch with me. Love it. All right. Thank you everybody again for joining. I love this kind of, the, this, the send off of optimism and thank you everybody that participated with all your questions, all your comments, we will get back to them. Uh, post session. But with that, I will uh, click click end session here and thank everybody for joining. Bye from Thanks. Chicago. Bye. Bye, Bye. from Holland.